And they've been able to say, like, you should be glad you're not black, and I've had no grounds to argue with them. Like, I've had, you know, I can agree with them. And, and, I'm not, and I'm not saying, like, I'm any kind of, like, champion of civil rights or anything like that, but it is, like, even to this day, like, you know, very, um, like, you know, you take the concept of separate and, uh, you know, separate and, e- you know, separate and unequal, and it's still very much rings very true, like, it's no, it's really no, I mean, it's gotten slightly better, <coughs> but, I mean, it's still very, very much like separate and unequal in the United States of America in a lot of in a lot of in a lot of regards, but it certainly still does fall along, you know, divisions of race. Can I give an example that relates to what you're talking about with violence? Yeah. So very recent, uh, a, a little over ten years ago, the, we got a lot of press for the uh, Columbine shootings, and what I found shocking about that was that the complaint was that. There was a kind of innocence broken in having gun violence in a high school. Right. And when I went to high school in a black school in the Bronx in 1986, I had to walk past a metal detector every single day in order to get into the building. So this is 1986 versus Columbine in 1999. And so the point is, that, like, as you say, black people have been living in inner cities with a level of violence, a level of threat that would be utterly unacceptable at a school where it was majority white. Yeah. So it's deeply ingrained into us that, as a culture, we accept different standards, as you're saying, separate yeah. and not equal. We accept different standards, and it shocks our moral conscience for certain things to happen to white yeah. subjects, white people, that we should know are happening regularly to black and non other non whites. Yeah. I'm Andrea. Uh, I don't. I never really like growing up in this area. I never really realized like how big of a, a problem the segregation here is until I lived in Denver for a number of years, where there's really more segregation between like, Mexicans and, and whites than than we're really having like uh, just areas that are just black in that city. They, they really don't have that there. In the Mexican area, so there's like more segregation there. Um, but moving back here, I mean, the, the racism in the city is really it's shocking after living someone the, the you know, shocking after living somewhere for a number of years where it wasn't really directed at the blacks so much in that area, just how that can sort of be directed at any population. Um, is, is really shocking. Um, and also, I was on a jury recently where the defendant was black, and it was disturbing to me. Oh, there was only one other black person on the jury, first of all, but that, there really were some racist attitudes that were expressed, and that, I mean, I just found it difficult to sort of swallow that, that, you know, that is the only, I, I mean, I think that, that the trial was not handled poorly or anything, but, but you know, that it was difficult for, um, you know, to see that this is the type of jury that makes decisions routinely uh, in the Anderson County. Tell us your name. And, yeah. My name is Alex, and uh, nothing much to say. I think this uh, segregation, discrimination is counterproductive and uh, hurts uh, both blacks and whites, and uh, there is racism uh, on the part of the blacks too against whites in the community, and uh, the, we, we should move eventually to, to better integration. Everybody should be equal and sh- sh- should live to, to his God-given potential. Quick point for the Occupy think. movement in terms of whether this is counterproductive. Remember that it's productive for someone. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, keeping yes, people but, apart yes. is productive oh, for yes. someone. <laughs> it's counterproductive for the society. For most it's counterproductive us. for the society as a whole. There are certain, certain people that um, benefit from yes. it. Like uh, Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> Michael, you have anything to add? Well, growing up in Buffalo, I, I, I'm not from here, actually. Uh, I'm originally from Jacksonville, Florida. Oh. My, my parents are from Tonawanda. My mother's from Kenmore. My dad's from the town. And my dad was in active duty when I was born. Uh, so I was born in the Navy base. And I like to say that I was damned. I don't, I don't feel like I was touched by white privilege, although the other day I feel that I was. Um, 
but I, I feel that I was damned from the from the, from, from the moment I was born because I was born in a Navy base, and it just so happens that all three boys that were born in the same year, 1979, a boy by the name of Robert, a boy by the name of Thomas, and a boy by the name of Michael, which is me, uh, all came down with le severe learning disabilities and bipolar disorder. Wow. All came down with severe learning disabilities and bipolar disorder. And I was later on diagnosed with not only bipolar disorder, but also schizoaffective disorder. And when Thomas tried to go back to the military base to get his, uh, to get his birth documents, well, number one, the base is destroyed. Number two, uh, they denied that he even he even was born there. So that was that was really really. But, uh, the kid black? No, no, they, all three of them. Were, Thomas was was white, uh, and then Robert was white too. It's really really interesting. So I can say I was damned from birth, but and I'm I'm a product of a government experiment. But I'm not going to go there because then they're going to call me schizoaffective again. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, growing up in the city of Buffalo, I moved. I, I lived in Brunswick, Maine, spoke Google Gaga language there, and then I moved. My dad became a Navy recruiter in the city of Buffalo. So I, I grew up in, in a very privileged part of Buffalo, the Parkside area, where I wasn't uh, I wasn't um, ha as affected by gang violence as, as, as more of the kids more towards Main Street or the Bailey area were affected by gang violence. Uh, those are the children I went to school with, and then um, I learned what white privilege was when I, when I went into the school system, and my only outlet was was the theater arts program where. We all got to be creative and stuff like that, but it was definitely a predominantly African American school that I went to. And then I went to performing arts high school, and then later on ECC City, and then and then Buffalo State College. But what struck me the most was that every time I went to tell people, "Well, where do you go? ECC City? You actually like it down there? Of course I like it down there. I think I I, I don't have a car, so I'm not going to go to the other campuses." <laughs> I, I rode take my the bus. bus. Yeah, take the bus. Go, go to, and I, and I, and I felt out of place at ECC North Campus when I went there for a ah. summer school class. And Professor George Robbins, who who, who changed <coughs> me from from a right leaning libertarian to a democratic socialist, he said, "Michael, you know, I, I teach out of North Campus, but I don't get the same reaction as in class because he teaches uh, U.S. history and government." I don't get the same reaction in class as I do with my city, my city, uh, my city campus students. So that was always a big thing, and one of the reasons why I'm not a Republican is because I got so pissed off at the county government for segregating the races in Buffalo. I mean, I, I, partially you could blame the Buffalo Democrats for doing that too, because look who has the west side of Main Street. It's Lynn Marinelli. This is this is going. This is in, in, near the Parkside area. Look who has the east side of Main Street. It's uh, Demont Smith. Just just look at that divide, and it may be a little small line on the map, but it's still the the, the east uh, the east side of Main Street versus the west side of Main Street. Uh, what would you call the here? Mm -hmm. Demograph demographic. Oh, it's, it's, it's part of institutional racism. Yeah, part of institutional racism. So that's what really sick of me. And then, and then, and then, my last point is: take a look at the rail line and the bus system in this in this county, and you will see the racial divide. Yeah, there's a technical term called hyper segregation. Hyper segregation. Yeah. Hey, I'm Dan. I just wanted to. Uh, I think I know what Henry was uh, saying. Uh, I think I go along with that. That uh, if if this if this occupy were mostly. Non-white people, it would be a lot different reaction. 